Welcome to the premiere edition of Africa Focus here on Switch TV. I'm Lenny Rashid. Let's take a look at some of the stories we have prepared for you today. Breaking bad, Nigeria grapples with an ever-increasing methamphetamine problem. Protecting African wildlife, French designers come up with a tracker that can help in conservation efforts. And find out how mobile cinemas are being used to promote peace in the Central African Republic. Before we get into the main stories, let's take a look at some of other stories making the headlines around Africa in brief. A truth commission in the tiny West African state of the Gambia began hearing witness testimony on Monday as it set about investigating rights violations committed by the regime of Yahya Jame. Model on South Africa's investigation into its apartheid era, the commission will hold hearings into Jame's 22-year era of oppression, which ended in 2016 after he was forced from power. President Adama Barrow has hailed the commission as a step towards national healing and a way to prosecute those responsible and offer for some closure to victims and families. On Monday, Ebrima Chongan, Police Assistant Inspector General before the 1994 coup, which brought Jame to power, testified how he was dragged from police headquarters and held in solitary confinement in a prison outside the capital, Banjul. In Guinea, a graffiti bearing the portrait of former President Sekou Toure is causing controversy in the capital, Conakry. It is located on a symbolic bridge where people were hung by the Sekutori regime on 20th January 1971. An association of victims' relatives says it's an insult to the memory of these people. The mural depicts the heroes of African independence and also includes portraits of Bukinabe Thomas Sankara, Ghanaian Kwame Nkrumah, and Guinea-Bissau Amilcar Cabral. Hundreds of protesters marched in Sudan's capital Khartoum, in an attempt to reach the presidential palace, but were dispersed by security forces with tear gas and stun grenades. Crowds of men and women marched together as they chanted freedom and peace in unison before tear gas was fired towards them. Witnesses said security forces blocked Khartoum University professors and lecturers from coming out to join the protest, arresting at least eight. The rest were forced to run into the faculty clubhouse, where security forces surrounded the building, trapping about a hundred professors and lecturers inside for nearly three hours. A police spokesman could not immediately be reached to comment. Although Sunday's gathering drew smaller crowds, anti-government protests have overall posed the most serious challenge to President Omar al-Bashir's rule since they began last month. Egypt will hold the 2019 Africa Cup of Nations between June 15 and July 13. Confederation of African Football President Ahmed Ahmad announced in Dakar on Tuesday. The CAF Executive Committee preferred Egypt to South Africa as replacement for original host Cameroon, who were dropped due to delays in preparations and concerns over security. It will be the fifth time Egypt stayed the biannual showpiece of African football after 1959, when the country was called the United Arab Republic. 1974, 1986, and 2006. Egypt only entered the running to host the Cup of Nations when fellow North African country Morocco announced they would not bid to do so. Morocco were the hot media favorite to replace Cameroon as host, and Egypt said they didn't want to compete against a fellow Arab nation. Egypt hosts many international standard venues in the Cairo International Stadium and Bojel Arab Stadium in Alexandria, hosting the largest capacities. Nigeria has long been a transit point for cocaine and heroin, but in recent years, the country has become a growing producer of methamphetamine. The drug has become popular around the world and is very profitable, causing a major security problem for the country where armed gangs are vying for control of the market. Let's take a look. This is one of the largest seizures of methamphetamine ever made in Nigeria. In mid-November, the anti-drug agency discovered this secret laboratory hidden in the jungle near the southeast city of Oweri. Inside the lab, investigators found drugs worth over a million dollars. On the 9th of November, a team from our headquarters came here and they discovered the lab just behind us. 
a lab or the cover where they produce this meth. And we all know meth is a very dangerous drug. Drug enforcement officials arrested dozens of people, including the kingpin, a man in his 30s who amassed a considerable fortune thanks to the drug trade. Drug trafficking is not new to Nigeria. The country has long been a transit point for cocaine and heroin going to Europe and North America. But around 10 years ago, methamphetamines began to be actually produced in the country, meaning Nigerians now control the whole supply chain. Assuming there are 10 or 15 meth labs all over the country, then you can be talking about over a ton per week being produced in Nigeria and it's being shipped out of the country. One kilogram of meth sells for up to $150,000 in Asia, and Nigerian cartels are waging a merciless war for control over the market. Last year, heavily armed men burst into a church in the southeast village of Uzubulu during Sunday mass and shot into the crowd. Thirteen members of the congregation were killed, the victims mostly women and children. A volcanic eruption. It was just, just shootings from at randomly and recklessly inside the church. Uh, before I know what was happening, a lot of people have been shot. The traumatized residents fear that such violence could happen again. With porous borders and widespread corruption, Nigeria risks becoming the world's next narco state. Zalambesa is an Ethiopian city on the border of Eritrea, destroyed during the 1998-2000 war between the two countries. The city has been experiencing a revival of sorts after 20 years thanks to the opening of the border. Let's get more on this. For 20 years, this border crossing was deserted. Today, it's teeming with buses and trucks queuing to cross. In July, Eritrea and Ethiopia signed a historic peace agreement after 20 years of conflict. Since the border opened, the number of Eritreans fleeing the country's repressive regime has tripled. Nebat Zaria left with her three daughters. I couldn't run away before because I was under 20. You have to be 30 to be able to leave the country, so I had no choice but to wait. Eritrea has one of the weakest economies in Africa and among its worst records on human rights. The majority of the population is not allowed to leave the country and cannot escape compulsory and indefinite military service. The border town of Zalambesa is attracting those who dream of leaving, but also visitors who want to see more of it. I'm very surprised. I didn't expect such a level of development. It's very surprising, but I'm happy. Trucks, people and goods are traveling in both directions. To the delight of Eritreans, Ethiopian traders come by bus to bring everything they can sell to the market in Sinafe, an Eritrean town 23 kilometers north of the border. We have everything we didn't have before, from the smallest product to the largest product. Things we didn't have before are coming from Mekele and Adigrat. Ethiopian traders are embracing the opportunities, but remain skeptical of trade terms. The value of the Eritrean currency, the NAFCA, is much higher than the Ethiopian burr, reminiscent of trade issues that ignited the 1998 war. It's been described as one of the best places for biodiversity on the planet. But there are fears that the Atewa Range Forest Reserve in Ghana is under threat because of what's under the soil, bauxite. The Atewa Range Forest Reserve is home to some of the world's most critically endangered animals. But under the ground are also large reserves of bauxite, the mineral that makes the earth red and which is a key ingredient in making aluminium. Ghana's government has signed a multi-billion dollar deal with China to allow them to mine bauxite in exchange for vital infrastructure projects. The land around the reserve has previously been affected by illegal gold mining. We are going in for big, big trouble because the way bauxite mining is done is not like gold where you can take out the sand, put it somewhere and then fill it back. You're actually taking away the whole soil and with it you have to clear the forest to be able to get to that. Environmentalists say any pollution of the three rivers that have their source in the forest could affect millions of people downstream including in the capital, Accra. Being a national park, 
and then uh, establishing tourism activities here would help us better than uh, uh, the bauxite mines. Aluminium ore prospectors first came to the area more than a decade ago. Samples from their drilling have been abandoned. Some say investors pulled out because mining would have been too controversial. Others say it's needed to bring about greater prosperity. There's no job, so we want, we want boss and mining to come. Morally, we, we want it to come so that our people get a job to do. Ghana's president, Nana Akufo Addo, is from the main town of Kiebi on the eastern slopes of the forest. He's promoting rural development, but there's a growing campaign to stop him achieving it at the expense of the environment he's vowed to protect. Sigfox, a French tech company, has developed a bite-sized tracker that can be inserted into the horns of rhinos to help conservationists monitor and protect the endangered species. In the past few years, the demand for rhino horns have driven up the cost to as much as $100,000 per kilogram. Currently, there are about 5,400 black rhinos in the world today. Miniature tracking devices connected to the Internet of Things, IoT, are helping protect some of the world's most endangered animals against poaching. The tiny tracker developed by French tech company Sigfox is inserted into rhino horns to help conservationists monitor their movement. Very small captors that last a long time, that are low cost and low energy consuming, what can we bring to the issue of protecting species so that we can slow down their extinction or even avoid it? And so we started a project in Zimbabwe three years ago, inventing a prototype of a captor inserted in the horn of about 30 rhinoceroses, which emits the exact position of the rhinoceroses three times a day. With the dramatic decline of animal species in the past century, mostly due to poaching and urban expansion, wildlife organizations have turned to technology to help protect creatures that have been pushed close to extinction. Uh, Rangers and conservation experts to observe these animals from a distance, taking less risk and especially to anticipate potential dangers that the animal could take. Persistent poaching had seen the global number of rhinos dwindle to around 20,000 10 years ago, but thanks to conservation efforts, the numbers have increased to over 29,000, according to conservationists. Different technologies, including cameras, infrared and motion sensors, neck collars and drones, have been used over the years, but have sometimes been constrained by the vast terrain to cover limited battery life and high costs. Working with conservationists and specialized organizations, including the International Rhino Foundation, transmitters developed by Sigfox are able to give the exact location of 30 rhinoceroses spread across a 5,000 square kilometer reserve in Zimbabwe over a longer period of time. That is extremely important and new is that we listen to noise in a very simple way. It is not very complicated, actually. The sensors listen, they reveal to us a useful noise. For example, we installed captors on a fence or a gate, and this fence or gate vibrates, it opens. Sigfox is also teaming up with the foundation of British primatologist Jane Goodell to use the IoT to monitor a 21,000 square kilometer chimpanzee habitat in Tanzania. In the Gombe National Park and several other projects around Africa, the Jane Goodell Institute has introduced mobile applications and tablets to village monitors who record data in their surroundings, such as tree cats or sightings of chimpanzees' nests or animal traps. Uh, these, these village forest monitors are very proud, and we didn't dictate to them what they should record in the forest. They got together and they chose, okay, we'll record an illegally cut tree. We'll record an animal trap. We'll record a cartridge on the ground. We'll record the sighting of a chimp nest or the sighting of a leopard or a pangolin. So they decided, I forget the number. And for them, 
couldn't read and write, but they can press buttons and they could click photographs. And then all of that uploaded onto a platform in the clouds, Global Forest Watch. And he, you said, how has technology changed in your lifetime? Well, when I was a child, clouds only produced rain. Now they produce data. Director of the Sigfox Foundation, Marion Moru, said they can help improve internet connectivity across the villages and the reserve and facilitate better sharing of information. She added that they are also open to developing trackers suitable for chimpanzees as they embark on the five-year project with Goodall. Leangare for Africa Focus. Coming up after the break, war heroes. A Senegalese family looks back at the life of a soldier who served in World War II. For that and much more, don't go away. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Africa Focus here on Switch TV. Let's take a look at some of the events taking place on the African continent in the month of January. We now take you to Uganda, where the legendary Japanese Phil Rashomon is getting a Ugandan adaptation from the country's Wakaliwood Studios. The studio has so far made over 50 low-budget films in the past 13 years. Kampala's Wakaviga slum has been the home of Uganda's movie industry for the past 13 years. Over 50 low-budget films have been made so far at the Wakaliwood Film Studios, located in filmmaker Isaac Nabwana's backyard. His latest project is an adaptation of Rashomon, the Oscar-winning Japanese film from 1950 by legendary director Akira Kurosawa, which explores the subjective perception of truth through the eyes and memories of witnesses. Uh, it is uh, a story, I think, of all times, because it is uh, around 70 years, and if you watch it, you, it is, it is, it is uh, exactly what we go through. Uh, you know, women, uh, men, I mean, uh, uh, being, you know, not honest to each other. Uh, it is that betrayal. It is, uh, you know, killing innocent people. I decided to do it and then call it Boda Boda Kira. Famous for his action and witchcraft stories, Isaac and his team are masters of special effects and DIY props. Though the adaptation of Kurosawa's drama is a break from the norm, like all their films, the target audience remains the slum population and lead actor Apollo is sure they will like it. I love it because it was, I was surprised because this kind of movie, I don't think it is there in Uganda. It will be the first movie like this, this kind of. So I know the Ugandans will love it. The idea for the film came from French contemporary artist Louis Cyprien Rial, a long-standing fan of Wakaliwood movies. He won funding through the Sam Art Prize, an NGO that supports artistic collaborations between Europe and non-Western countries. Uh, we will exhibit this project in Palais de Tokyo for two months, from February to May 2019 in Paris. I will be very happy to screen this film in, in any places uh, of interest, in Japan for example, for sure, but in, also in Africa, um, because there is really a moving thing into African cinema right now. So I think it's also a part of African cinema. The average budget for a Wakaliwood film is just $200, and actors sell the DVDs on the streets as well as online to earn money. With the Ugandan version of Rashomon, the team is dreaming big, hoping it will gain recognition far and wide, 
and maybe even an Oscar nod. Now, do you know about your culture and tradition? A woman in Zimbabwe is bringing tradition to life as she hopes to inspire the next generation. Hatifari Munongi, a poet, storyteller, and retired school teacher, has built a replica traditional homestead at her property in the suburb of Marlboro in Harare. Let's take a look. Hatifari Munongi is something of a legend in Harare. Having grown up at a time when women's education was not a priority, she decided to go back to school after retiring. And two years ago, she graduated with a degree in sociology, gender and development, aged 78, becoming the oldest Zimbabwean woman to earn a degree. It was a great day, and I, I, I couldn't believe myself. One, that I had got a degree which I had always wanted to have. You know, my husband was a graduate, and I always wanted to be a graduate as well. Uh, so it was like a, a great achievement. Gogo, or Grandmother Mnongi, used to be a school teacher, and today she writes poetry and stories. Since graduating, she has also built a replica traditional homestead in suburban Harare to help preserve the country's rich cultural heritage. There's so many aspects of traditional life that are taught at this village which can benefit visitors in their upbringing and daily lives. Completed in 2017, the site features a round hut, cattle pen and rabbit run, all of which delight visiting school groups. I would like to urge all young children to visit the village because there is a lot to learn. They will have an opportunity to eat roasted maize, they will play traditional games like Nodo, they will listen to folk stories told by a grandmother. Gogo Mnongi hopes her achievements will educate and inspire younger generations. Women should try to, to dream big. Women should not let men dream for them. Women should dream for themselves. Hundreds of children have already visited Gobom Nongi's project and she hopes it will become a cornerstone of every Harare pupil's education. France enrolled some 600,000 troops from its colonies to fight the First World War. One of those was Abdoulaye Ndiaye, a Senegalese sharpshooter who fought in some of the most deadly battles of the Great War. He lived to the age of 104. His family looks back at his life. The town of Theowo, northern Senegal. It was in these humble surroundings that Senegal's last surviving World War I trooper lived out his final years. Abdoulaye Ndiaye fought for France from the beginning of the Great War. He left for the front in 1914. He talked about his journey from Dakar, where they received very basic military training in the camp of Thierroye. That's where they gave them basic training, for someone from the back country to become a soldier. Abdullaye was just 20 years old when he was sent to the battles of the Somme and Verdun. While fighting at the Somme, he received a serious head wound, which continued to cause him pain years later. At the end of the war, he returned to Senegal with a modest pension and a French railway pass, which he was never to use. What I know is that he was honoured to have accomplished something. I mean taking part in military combat with all the perils of war, the threat of death. To have done it for France, but also to have done it to bring honour to his father and his brothers. Abdoulaye lived to the age of 104, passing away in 1998, just one day before he was due to be presented with the Legion of Honour. He received the award posthumously. All that he earned, he shared. That is why he did not leave much behind. When he received his pension allowance, he would share it with others on the very same morning. As a last wish, he requested that France do something to improve his village. This French-funded road, known as Sharpshooter's Path, was opened in 2002. Today, 
Abdullaye's family just want to ensure that this legacy is maintained. On this show, we love hearing from you, so get interactive with us on our various social media pages. Let's take a look at what people are saying on the stories that we have covered today. Nkosi from Johannesburg, South Africa says, Great show. We hope that you can also cover some of the things happening here down south. Over in Nigeria, Abdullahi says that, Interesting. I'd like to see you cover more of West Africa in our show. And finally, in East Africa, John Jaroga says, this is what we've been lacking. Mobile cinema promotes peace in the Central African Republic. Despite the outbreak of violence in the country, a small group of volunteers are roaming the roads of the country, screening films in the most remotest of regions. In Bayanga, a pygmy region in the southwest of Central African Republic, where few people have ever seen a cinema screen, the traveling digital cinema broadcasts educational films to sensitize people to contemporary societal issues. For several months, this old car has been travelling along the rough roads of the Central African Republic. But this is not any old vehicle. It's a mobile cinema that roams the country showing films to audiences that have often never seen a screen before. The travelling digital cinema broadcasts thematic films, films which aim to sensitise the population to issues it is faced with. The issues the films cover are numerous and include vaccination, forced marriage and girls' education. For many Central Africans living in remote regions, cinema allows them to grasp societal problems which are systematically discussed following the screening. The film I saw yesterday on the big screen was extremely interesting. What I remembered is the importance that must be attributed to girls' schooling rather than to making them work. Although financed by UNICEF, the French Alliance of Bangui, and funds from other mobile cinemas in Africa, the project is struggling to survive. The organisers and technicians, all volunteers, have to make do with old equipment. We've made a crate to put the equipment inside so as to protect it from the road because the state of the roads isn't good. Despite difficulties, the mobile cinema wants to continue on its way getting closer to zones heavily affected by years of deadly conflict, with the hope of triggering dreams, emotions, perhaps even vocations. Thank you for watching the premiere edition of Africa Focus. We'd like to keep the conversation going across our social media platforms. For me and the entire team that has made this possible, Ubuntu to each and every one of you. Keep it switch.